It's been at least two years since I ripped into the latest iteration of the world's most popular role-playing game, quote-unquote. And at that time, only the base Trinity and One Adventure arc was released. Well, I've talked about it further, and I stand by several things I've said in that review. Time changes many things. I've had a lot of time to play and experience the other end of the foot, how this edition was people's gateway into the hobby. I've seen what the third party and fan community has done, which is much better in my opinion, but I'm not getting ahead of myself here. With how harsh I was in my old review, I'd have to be the biggest asshole to rain on this parade of new people jumping in, right? Well, probably, but I have a principle of honesty to hold to. I may be an ass, but at least I'm an ass you'll always know where I stand on something. So today I'm taking an in-retrospect look at 5th edition. From its beginnings as the next D&D, to its current state in terms of its design ethos, and how well the game's final design carries that ethos. It's time once again to head into that 20-sided breach. D&D 5th Edition billed itself as the uniting of the editions. They spoke frequently on taking aspects from the various editions past of D&D to try and craft a unified whole. This was touted frequently when it was referred to as the next D&D around 2012, or D&D Next. Shortly after, they announced an open beta test, which they would gradually expand and take surveys about, as well as posting blog posts to give ideas of their design goals. With how divisive 4th edition was, along with the rise of Pathfinder and the OSR scene as a demi-genre on its own, the idea of uniting old and new mechanics seems like an admirable goal. The problem, as is often the case, is in the execution. See, when D&D 3rd Edition came out in 2000, it represented a massive tonal shift in two ways. The first is the fact that many of the subsystems were unified around a single core mechanic, rather than the separate sets that had been used previously. More importantly, 3rd Edition paced a higher emphasis on individual customization with the retooled skill system and the introduction of feats. Advanced, conversely, was still significantly connected to its wargaming roots from the old chainmail days, with little in the way of character customization in the same manner and treating character classes more like a story arc. These two design philosophies are diametrically opposed to each other, and one of them has to go. But 5th edition wants to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to be simple and streamlined without mechanical bloat, but also give you the ability to customize your tool sets. It wants to allow for any style of fantasy, while still adhering to the Tolkien melting pot. While this could feasibly work, it would require a rethinking of several mechanics to fit into its new style to determine what does and doesn't fit. This is something they are unwilling to commit to, and the result is a designer's no-man's land. Further complicating this matter is a contradictory attitude that was exhibited by the fanbase. Many times I'd see demand that D&D act much less gamey and have more role-playing, while at the same time the people who'd voice those concerns would be running hex crawls and dungeons delts, the murder hobo game in a sense. In trying to please all its masters, it took the path of least resistance. Essentially, it became a flagellant whipping itself in the streets in penance. One claim I've made in the last few years is that D&D is a victim of its own traditions. To be clear, I'm not arguing that the motifs it has built over the decades are wrong, but rather they are accepted as gospel for gospel's sake. Many times certain mechanics have been used because that's what you're supposed to do as if that instantly justifies something that might or might not be on shaky foundation. During the D&D Next surveys, there were multiple times where the question of which of these items is important to you to make the game feel like D&D. These questions would list various spells, items, or monsters in the survey. Now I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that was the general angle with most of the surveys conducted. It was sort of like the no-character, no-buy attitudes from certain fighting game fans. This, to me, was a red flag. It implied to me that their priority was not in learning from the positives and negatives of previous editions. Their priority was instead overcompensating for 4th edition's changes because change is bad, okay? Once again, as I said in my video on 4th edition a while back, despite its problems, there were genuine advancements made. But throwing all that under the bus misses the point of why those advancements were made in the first place. Speaking of which... I said in my initial 5th edition review that a lot of the game's use of older mechanics didn't seem to understand the purpose of why those mechanics were implemented to begin with, 
In addition, several mechanics introduced during the playtest were hampered or restrained in a way that doesn't play to their strengths. To use a few examples, the maneuver dice was a resource that several martial classes had access to, namely the barbarian, fighter, monk, rogue, and cleric at higher levels. These dice would be a group of d6 that would range from 1 to 6 depending on your level. The dice could be utilized in one of two ways, either A, rolling them as extra damage, or B, spend them on maneuvers. Many attack-like feats and some class features are treated as maneuvers, such as bull rush, flurry of blows, and lunge. In a move not too dissimilar from lands in Magic the Gathering, maneuver dice are recovered at the start of each turn. While this mechanic would be utilized in 5th edition, it would be taken from a semi-universal idea and reduced to simply a subtype of fighter, the Battlemaster. Being essentially 5th edition's answer to the excellent Warlord class from 4th edition, the Battlemaster's maneuvers focused only on group tactics and little else. The message that was sent was that they didn't want martial characters to get too interesting, because that's what spellcasters are for. Okay, that's a bit hyperbolic on my part, but considering that an entire generation of players see fighters and barbarians as easy mode, only reinforces my disdain for the linear warrior's quadratic wizards, to steal a term from TV tropes. I'll probably delve into this further on in a later video. To put on my backseat design hat, I'd rather expand on this idea further by having maneuver dice be usable for boosting a attack, AC, or damage, but not more than one at one time. Furthermore, instead of it being D6s, have the maneuver die be able to increase or decrease their size based on their use. For example, a Barbarian's Rage might make damage boosts rolled as d8s, but they could not use dice on defense boosts. This could be expanded on with feats, such as allowing dice to be used on saving throws or to use spell maneuvers with a feat. Fantasycraft does something not too far off with its action dice, so I don't see a reason why D&D can't steal from the best. This may be a little controversial, but in my opinion D&D has struggled with skill systems because it was never really designed for them. 3.5 had far too many skills and too few points to distribute unless you were a skill monkey type character like a rogue. I think the training motif used in 4th edition, which they took from Star Wars Saga Edition, does a little bit better of a job with this leveled progression and encouraging variety in skill over the need to dump it all in a few skills. However, even the static bonus in this system could get a little samey, and it almost feels like a take 10 at some points. Next instead uses a skill die, growing from D4 to D12 based on your level. Doing this allows for some degree of risk, a la the stunt mechanic that's used in Flying Swordsman, and can also allow for skill rolls to be more involved. Furthermore, rogues could spend the skill die like a maneuver to utilize skill tricks they learn, allowing them to use skills in unique ways that other classes couldn't. The skill die was effectively nixed in 5th edition, in favor of a scaling proficiency bonus with skills, weapons, tools, and abilities benefiting from it. The skill tricks was subsequently removed. Expanding on the proficiency system in this manner spread it too far in my opinion, as well as force a type of meta that's against the vaunted storytelling it claims to support. Problem is, said storytelling is placed on such a high pedestal that it ignores how gameplay mechanics can reinforce storytelling, or even provide storytelling opportunities. This ironically makes characterization more restrictive than anything else, because their choices in build are so limited. Having proficiencies tied to classes makes it even worse, as if it's trying to reinforce stereotypes when they're not necessary. I think skill training should be divorced from classes completely, entirely based around backgrounds instead. Classes only granting equipment and some save proficiencies in order to make backgrounds matter more. I'd also advise giving each background a skill trick unique to it alone while still giving the rogue its skill trick options. This would demonstrate a divide between rogues and non-rogues in a way that's far less restrictive. To put it another way, it's a difference between what can you do versus what are you better at. Backgrounds are the least changed from next to 5th edition, and thus I won't have as much to say on this one. The primary difference is the replacement of skills with proficiencies. As I said before, the concept of background as a semi-life path isn't bad on paper. The problem that I had is how little the background mattered beyond proficiency picks. The trait of background and the character points doesn't matter beyond fluff. I have nothing against narrative-based experiences, but narrative does not excuse neglecting mechanics. The closest parallel I can think of is the themes from 4th edition, which provided a pool of alternative powers you could swap out as you leveled up. That's my ultimate issue. Beyond first level, backgrounds don't matter. Now, am I saying backgrounds should have some combat effect? No. 
I'm actually in favor of having proficiencies tied to classes and skills tied to background. However, in the spirit of uniting additions, I'd argue that the background mechanic provides the perfect opportunity to revive the concept of station as you level up. In earlier editions, and in some retro clones, you have a title based on your level, eventually allowing you to have greater pull and your own followers. Now, I'm not saying you should always get followers at a certain level. Instead, you might be able to call upon better resources for a vocation, or convince a similar vocation to call on a favor for you. To me, this would help the background matter in more than just your origins. Optimization and personalization are two things a narrative game will struggle with as the lengthy arguments and ideal builds demonstrate. I've seen it argued that going for unoptimized build can lead to opportunities for role-playing. That may be the case in certain games, but as a general rule, I don't agree. Role-playing or story gaming should not be used as an excuse for poor game design. That said, I do sympathize with people who find the depth of options in certain games daunting, but don't want to be the party load. Packages, in my opinion, were an excellent compromise. They provide a themed suggestion to build off of, and deviate when people are more comfortable with things. Next, address this with certain packages that could be picked from, ranging from the monastic traditions for monks to the fighting styles for fighters to rogue schemes for rogues. This, along with the specialties we'll get into later, allows for a framework of build, the one that provides enough wiggle room to personalize the character beyond mere fluff. Much of this was reduced to a feature at each class for first level for their respective classes, those that weren't were integrated into the subclass system. And my problem with this is that it limits potential setup severely, leading to the stereotypes I talked about before. With next and fifth edition being a uniting of the editions, allegedly, and a culmination of D&D's history, also allegedly, it'd be a perfect opportunity to steal from a previous iteration of D20 again, namely D20 Modern's talent trees. Treat each package, in this case, fighting style, rogue scheme, etc., as a talent tree that one may pick from as they level. In the fighter's case, treat duelist, marksman, protector, and slayer as separate talent trees with a group of suggested maneuvers. Alternatively, the talent trees could take a cue from the power themes from 4th edition. This would make the choices matter across all levels, not specific levels as in 5th edition. When feats were introduced in 3rd edition, the idea was to allow a degree of personalization to a character's abilities beyond their race and class. While the feats would balloon out of control over the years, the intent was still clear. Owing to the ivory tower design that Monty Cook spearheaded, and later regretted, the feats were one of the bigger hurdles to optimization, since you needed a degree of expertise out of the gate just to navigate some of the more ridiculous feat requirements. Next answer to this was the specialties. Essentially, a themed package of suggested feats based on a specific approach. As I said in my initial 5th edition review, Feats were reduced to an optional alternative to the ability score improvement found every four levels. I said that this would swing the pendulum too far the other way. Now granted, individual feats in this case provide multiple benefits, but this is not an effective trade-off to make up for the underlying message. With only four feats across an adventuring career, assuming that you even get that far, you are to be put on a particular path and don't you dare veer off that road. Personally, I'd opt to keep the specialty package idea. It's not too far removed from the theme seen in player guides and other games. Two examples that come to mind are the Runner's Companion for Shadowrun and the Charm Packages in the Exalted Player's Guide. Once again, I would take some cues from Fantasy Craft and organize the feats into specific categories, while lightening up on the feat requirements. Doing this would be an effective way to make clear what would be an effective build option for character archetypes without pigeonholing them into that setup. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that... Pathfinder 2nd Edition's feat system isn't doing something too far removed from this, but I'm basing that solely on the previews. Hit Dice and Fifth seem to be a successor to the Healing Surges from 4th Edition, but only understanding it as a means of self-healing. The reason Healing Surges were introduced into 4th Edition was to lessen the burden of a dedicated healer, and by being based on a set amount made it fairly reliable. Iron Heroes had a similar approach, but instead gave you a secondary pool to draw from. I've seen people treat healing surges as unrealistic, a la they gave people Wolverine level healing. But I find this faulty due to the fact that hit points are not akin to wounds in other games, but I digress. It seems that hit dice wanted to be a small pool of emergency hit points, but having it randomized completely can discourage use and encourage hoarding. Essentially, they wanted to still have hit dice, but not making them too unrealistic. This results in them 
without understanding why they were a presence to begin with. They don't add or take away any dynamic. In my review of Star Wars Saga Edition, I criticized how the expansions were extremely grab bag, having fluff and crunch for multiple classes at the same time. This can make builds difficult to reference as they'd have to dig through multiple source books at once. D&D 3rd and 4th Edition, for the most part, did not have this problem. 3rd Edition had the complete series of expansions, while 4th had the power series of books. In 5th Edition, in the name of reviving AD&D's modules apparently, they end up bringing back this problem. Only just recently has there been a first party source book that is solely geared toward one aspect of customization. The much ballyhooed Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which is just a collection of items presented in the Unearthed Arcana series of free PDFs, is the only PC-focused sourcebook released by Withers that I have so far. The majority of the first party content has either been setting pieces or modules that have material for GMs and players simultaneously. While I'm fine with this kind of sourcebook from time to time, when it becomes the norm I have to take issue. I understand that they might want to avoid sourcebook bloat, which is admirable. But I maintain that's no reason to stuff everything into singular books while expecting the third party and the fans to pick up the slack. But I know why they took this module-based approach. I don't like the reason, but I know it. There's no denying that 5th edition has had a surge in popularity for D&D as a whole. But as I observed this growth, I began to notice a few trends. Most prevalently, the aforementioned term, the world's most popular. While certainly true, the liberal use of the term carries an implication that instead of being the game being popular because it's good, it's good because it's popular. The D&D brand seems to be more important than the D&D game, as it were. Hence the repeated use of most popular in its labeling and descriptions, something that was not used in previous iterations or even during the D20 bubble in the early 2000s. It is in the name of being popular that seems to be at the heart of many aspects of 5th edition's design. Consider the following. Why focus on module expansions and Adventurers League? to mimic Pathfinder's adventure path in society? Why have simplified character customization? To mimic the design choices in the OSR scene? Why have narrativist aspects like background and inspiration? To mimic the aspects in Fate and other narrative-centric games? Why treat Forgotten Realms as the default setting? Because it happens to be the most popular one through its exposure in the video games. It's certainly understandable, but not exactly admirable. In hindsight, it's amusing that 4th edition was accused of trying to turn D&D into an MMO. While I've already said my piece on that claim, I would also argue that 5th edition is trying to be like everything else. It's akin to a AAA video game from a major publisher in both good and bad. I believe that a new addition to an RPG should build and progress upon the efforts of its predecessor. It's a time to examine what fundamentally works and what doesn't. 5th edition is not a progression. It's a retreat. Something I find fairly telling is the words used by the loudest voices in favor of 5th edition. It's not as bad as 4th. It's got a lot more freedom. It's the greatest hits of the editions. It's easier to get into. And so on. What I do not often hear from these people is what in the game's mechanics specifically they like. What about playing this game specifically they like. For myself, there's little of that 5th edition does that I can't just find just as easily or better in other fantasy games. All of this speaks to a loss of identity. Dungeons & Dragons has been suffering from an identity crisis for quite some time, especially due to having far too many masters to answer to, and it's unable to determine what it brings to the table other than its large fan base and production values. It's said that if one's going to destroy, they have to rebuild. To that end, it would be unfair of me to tear D&D 5th Edition to pieces if I didn't offer some alternatives. The following RPGs are a few games that could easily fill the same niche that D&D 5th Edition does at your table, and even if it doesn't, they're worth looking into to draw ideas from. I'll be covering them briefly as I might review some of these games in the future, and at least one of them, well, I already have. The subject of my first ever review on this channel, Heroes Against Darkness is described as a Nexus game instead of a retro clone. While it uses basic 1st Edition as a base, it takes in aspects from 1st through 4th into that framework. While it lacks the customization of other games in this list, it makes up for it by tributing D&D without being slavish to some of its more questionable traditions. Throughout the game, it has a clear intent of what it wants to do, and its creator illustrates the method to his particular madness. Best of all, it's free. By far the most popular 4th edition successor among a lot of people, Strike carries over 4th edition's tactical combat, but still puts a great deal of attention on personalization. Instead of living and dying on your class, advancement is split four ways. Class, 
role, kit, and reputation. Moreover, it's a very newbie-friendly game without sacrificing the essence of what RPGs are. One of the more recent and crunchier entries in this series, Unchained Heroes places a degree of emphasis on tactical resource management, from energy for your techniques to advantages over the enemy to even combat time. It uses a semi-real-time approach to turn order that de-emphasizes the race for first in initiative, since the highest initiative declares his action last. Actions have varying setup times, with more powerful actions being slower than others. The OGL version of it is free, but I would recommend taking a look at the full version if you feel like putting down a few pounds. Not to be confused with the version of RuneQuest that Mongoose made when they lost the RuneQuest license, Legend System is a heavily modified version of 3.5 that is based around empowering player control while smoothing some of the rougher parts of it. Through its track system, Legend is one instance where multiclassing is not only feasible, but actively encouraged. As a result, builds that might have been an extreme stretch in other games are perfectly doable here. Developed by 3rd edition's Jonathan Tweet and 4th edition's Rob Heinso, 13th Age is a pure hybrid of ideas between the two of those editions of D&D. Acknowledging the flaws of both, 13th Age combines the customization and unified mechanics of 3rd with the ease of play and tactical balance of 4th, in both cases not relying on miniatures. In addition, 13th Age introduces an escalation die mechanic that represents rising momentum and advantage as battles pass. The writing itself contains a great deal of asides from the developers, explaining why mechanics were done that way, design ideas they like deviating from, and sometimes providing differing suggestions to issues. It gives a sense of the devs playing and replaying this game frequently, and that passion for the design is infectious. An easy way to describe Fantasy Craft is to compare its design ideas to that of Pathfinder. Pathfinder intended to improve on and extend 3rd Edition's issues and strengths. Fantasy Craft instead chooses to break down the D20 system to its core concepts and rebuilds everything from the ground up. What results is a game that's the most modular and customizable form of D&D and puts a lot more emphasis on being multiple types of fantasy instead of a series of vague ideas. Its tagline of Your Dungeon, Your Dragon, Your Way is an apt descriptor for the amount of control that players and GMs have within it. I've said in the past that the best D&D experiences are found outside of D&D. For all of its popularity, it's still not the catch-all game that people claim it is. It's for that reason that I encourage finding the right game for a particular genre, style, group, or source material. We became geeks, nerds, and so on because we pursued a hobby that puts us on the outside of the mainstream. And as I said early on, what sense would it make to pursue the popular entry in role-playing because it's the in thing to do? Geekdom is not about being part of the in crowd, it's about being part of your crowd. Gaming is a hobby defined by people who do what they love regardless of what others think of them. What passion for the medium is found in popularity? 